I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the ResourceWorks Society, his website ResourceWorks.com. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you, Jim. It's been a week since the Federal Court of Appeal ruled that the National Energy Board has to go back and reconsult First Nations about the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Plus, they have to take into consideration possible impacts on orcas off the coast from an extra tanker a day. So, what is the cost to Canadians of this decision? Well, I think a lot of people are wondering that. And I was looking at some of the numbers today. It's hard to say what the total cost is, but let's just take, for example, five of the major companies that are intimately part of the pipeline proposal. These are what in the oil and gas industry they call the shippers, the ones who want to do the shipping of their products through the pipeline once it's built. And these are companies uh, that are in some cases household names like uh, Suncor and Synovus. Uh, Tech is a very well-known company in Vancouver. We think of it as a mining company, but don't forget it's got a big piece of the Fort Hills project in Alberta, the newest oil sands mine, a phenomenal innovation story, by the way, but uh, that's for another time. Also, Meg Energy, which is one of the most amazing, innovative little companies, much smaller than those other ones. And then uh, behemoth company, Canadian Natural Resources Limited, five companies. I had to look at them, uh, took the charts, did a, a few sums, and I figure that since that decision on the 29th, we've seen a loss in, in share value, in shareholder value of $8 billion dollars. Uh, now, these are companies, Jim, that employ 40,000 Canadians. I'm sure a lot of them have got, uh, if not options, they've got their pensions tied up in the fortunes of the company. And so does everybody else because the uh, Canadian uh, pension plan has got very significant, about a billion and a half dollars invested into just those five companies I've named. And they've looked at probably a loss of $90 million to our national pension plan since the decision now of course markets go up and they go down yes they do i i wanted to make sure that i was onto a valid trend here i fact checked it against just a couple of companies for example exxon you know you might say oh well this is just a trend in the energy business isn't it Stu? well actually no it's not exxon has been on a you know flat steady path it hasn't been affected by this that's an, a, obviously a u.s company um this is something uh, special that was visited upon our markets by very specific incidents. You can see it in the markets. That's when the markets reacted. And so far, we haven't seen them bounce back. So hopefully at some point in time they will. But uh, the factor is, of course, that people are calculating what is the value of these companies in future. That's what a stock mark, uh, stock price to a great extent is about. And uh, there's there's a recalculation of that that brings it down by the amount I've said by $8 billion dollars. So that's something that I think uh, fund managers, personal investors, people looking at their RRSPs are all thinking about, you know, what, why, why would a federal court, you know, I mean, these judges, they're just getting a check from Ottawa. They don't care. Um, the, uh, pe- people who do care about economic performance and, and their jobs make a difference to the value the country gets from their efforts. I think those are the ones who are worried about what's going on here, Jim. I'm certainly worried. Do you feel Ottawa could fix this with legislation, or was it because they were so slow to get off the block to start with? Yeah, I think Ottawa could have been a lot more uh, firm in what the the rules of the, the game are. You know, it seems to me that the federal court uh, didn't bother to understand what the uh, remit of the National Energy Board is. It has certain things it's bound by law to do, and other things it's bound by law not to do, or or not not told by law to do. Anything to do with legislation and regulation is is very specific um you know the the idea that uh the neb didn't do something that it wasn't supposed to do is is to me uh not a strong reason to reject the work of that body and criticize it for being not thorough i think that was most unfair and 
what's going on right now with replacing the NEB. You know, this is a globally respected uh, leading uh, institution that is created by par- the Parliament of Canada to manage national energy policy and affairs and decisions. Uh, it's admired around the world. I, I've heard that from all kinds of people internationally who don't have any political skin in the game. Our government right now is setting to uh, dismantle it, move it to Ottawa, away from where the energy expertise is in oil and gas, and and also, um, you know, just change its name and try to bury the, the very politicized past. Uh, you know, I think that's a big mistake. They should they should steady on because it's an asset that belongs to all of us. And and I think it's uh, actually insulting to those who have, as professionals uh, over many many decades, made it into an envied body for adjudicating uh, energy matters. So um, a lot of other people are concerned about this too. That's contained in Bill C-69. That's another story. But as far as the short term goes, you know, did the court uh, take uh, on board all of the necessary facts? I, I, I don't, uh, I think they were uh, wrongly swayed by the activists who have been funded by our American competitors to smear and take down uh, the Canadian energy activity to the advantage of American investors, which is, again, another of the small tragedies in this whole thing. Do you think there should be more focus on who is funding these protest groups? Yes, I think we should be having a national conversation. The fact that so many of the people from these activist groups are now in very cushy, publicly paid positions uh, in ministerial offices in, in Ottawa, I think they're preventing these questions from being asked. I think that's a scandal by itself. And, and I'm not saying that as an extremist. Uh, you know, I, I, th- I think that uh, people with an interest in energy, whatever that is, energy transition, clean energy, all of the diversity of energy, it's all good. We need energy. You know, Jim, we've talked about it before. At one time in humanity and still in parts of the world, a uh, single person would need 4,000 calories in the total energy diet. So that's the food they eat. We know we equate food to calories very easily, but also, you know, the firewood and the the uh, warmth and other transportation needs, you know, it's been calculated 4,000 calories a day. Well, nowadays, that number is about 50 times that. It's 200,000 calories a day. We live in the 200,000 calorie per person per day civilization, and somehow we have to get the energy. We have to do it in a way that doesn't destroy the planet or despoil the air. Everyone knows that. We're not debating that. And, and, and I think it is uh, a disservice when we have uh, too heavy a hand on policy. You know, today I noticed that there's actually a conference, it sounds like it's paid for by Ottawa, to debate the question of, uh, you know, how sh- how does the energy sector get to have more gender balance in it? And they, they seem to be pitting the clean energy, or so-called clean energy sector, against the traditional energy sector with a statistic I found absurd, which is that only, according to the press release from Ottawa, only 25% of the oil and gas workforce is female, whereas the clean energy workforce, now wait for it, what do you think the number is? Because they're so much better than the traditional one, right, Jim? What do you think their number is? I have no idea. It's 24%. Now, I guarantee you that's not even statistically significant as a difference. So, okay, we know that people who work in trades, who move bulldozers around and drive these trucks, probably more men doing that, fair enough. Let's get more women in, fair enough. But to to use it as yet another bludgeon to try to call out on the flimsiest of data uh, the the oil and gas industry for not being as enlightened when it when the, that's the difference twenty four percent versus twenty five percent it just it just tells you that there are ideologues funding these conferences and and other things going on in Ottawa right now they've gotten control of the agenda I, I think uh, we as Canadians are too polite. You know, and and again, there's nothing at all that is uh, extreme in what I'm saying. This is just common knowledge. It's what a reasonable, ordinary person can conclude from looking at some readily available facts. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after the break. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. 
surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines. Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Vatic Ventures Corp. is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, I heard something like 8,000 people were told to lay down their equipment when the court decision came down on the pipeline. What kind of an economic cost and fallout will there be from this either delay or postponement or cancellation? Yeah, well, I've spent about the past five years looking at the economic impact of the energy, the resource sectors generally, and so mining, forestry, aquaculture in the economy. And even though I'm not a proper economist, I did study economics at university, but I'm not really an economist per se. I'm more of a journalist, finance journalist, a writer. So I'm looking for the story here. And here's the story I'm seeing, Jim. It's that today Canada is a country that is made wealthy, prosperous, a leader in human rights, a beacon of civic discourse around the world is made so by its efficient and environmentally sound use of its natural resources. You know, we don't really have a lot of other things going for us. And, hey, we we should. I'd be the first one to say, let's get the high-tech sector, let's have the brains as well as the, the brawn uh, used. But you know what? When you start to look at natural resources as part of our economy, and that includes the oil sands, you realize that the brains and the brawn are actually incredibly combined already in that sector. It's because of the innovation that through legislative requirements and global competition um, requiring us to to always get better and lower costs and get more efficient that we have got some of the best processes for finding and extracting and processing and moving and marketing our natural resources that we're able to be this sort of high-tech natural resource country in a way that's unmatched by every other country. Now, you might look at, uh, you know, the certain countries like Norway. They actually score higher than us in sustainability. We could learn from them. But you won't find other countries with our natural resources that match us in the overall rating we have. In fact, we're, out of all the countries in the world, we're number 17 in our sustainability index, which when you think about it, you know, there's a lot of countries like... uh you think you go to Europe, look at, look at Liechtenstein. I mean, there's a country that consumes, it doesn't produce any resources. They consume everything. Uh, you look at, uh, uh, countries like China, uh, very low down the list. You look at Saudi Arabia, it's very de- low down the list of, and the list I'm talking about is the UN Sustainable Development Goals Index. Canada is number 17 on that. Even though we are constantly hearing from environmentalists who say we're terrible. Well, we're not terrible by any reasonable measure. And so, you know, we're talking about what is the wider economic impact of the pipeline judicial decision. I'm saying that it is affecting our ability to be an innovative country. We're starving our companies of capital. And hey, just today or yesterday, we heard from Suncor, Steve Williams, CEO, saying, you know what, until this pipeline nonsense is resolved, Suncor, one of the greatest Canadian companies, is not going to be investing in Canada. I mean, that's that's a terrible thing for such a CEO to have to say. And he's not saying it to be mean to Canada. Uh, he's saying it because he's got shareholders and a board. So that's what those people are, are signaling. Um, don't put your money into Canada because it doesn't need, uh, you don't need to uh, watch it uh, decline because you've gone into a country that doesn't value innovation. And I think this is one of the things. Here's another thing, though. There's taxes, income taxes that are paid. So the the best jobs in the country in terms of pay in any industry, in the industrial sector, are in mining. And mining captures oil sands mining. So when you hear people say mining jobs pay well, they mean both those things. And so 
big salaries mean big taxes paid to Ottawa to fund all the services that Ottawa has to provide. Then there's a whole other part of the economy, which is the goods and services required to be innovative and to develop the resources. And that goes from one end of the country to the other. It really does. You look at, uh, I think, CAP's website, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. They've done all sorts of studies on this stuff. You can see they've got uh, lists of companies in every single province that provide expertise and and uh, goods to be able to, you know, have the industry we've got, even though it's based in Alberta. You know, the notion that it's all sort of about Alberta and for Alberta is absolute nonsense, Jim. It's one of the great myths, and uh, I, I think we really need to continue to work on opening up the eyes of Canadians to appreciate the assets that make us this this really great little country with a big land area. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of Powerband Solutions. Powerband is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. Powerband Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerbandSolutions.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, part of the court ruling on the pipeline was more consultation, real consultation had to take place with First Nations. What have you heard? Yeah, and I think that's that's going to be so important. I hope that it's done in a legitimate way. And by legitimate, I mean it embraces the views of, of all of the First Nations who are affected by the pipeline. Um, the ones we tend to hear about most who have the most, uh, I guess, public relations consultants provided by the American billionaires are based in Vancouver. Um, I know that uh, uh, they have got legitimate issues over water and safety, transportation. I, I would be the last one to to diminish the importance of those issues. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we must recognize that if you're two First Nations or three First Nations, uh, that three is a much smaller number than 40 or 50, which is the number of First Nations that support the pipeline, who see the value of it. And I interviewed one such uh, chief uh, from a First Nation, a smaller one, recently. We actually posted at ResourceWorks a video of Chief Mike Laborde from the Whispering Pines First Nation, north of Kamloops. I've visited his First Nation, heard an amazing story of how that nation came to be what it is today. Also heard from Chief Laborde about why it was that he was so supportive of the pipeline project. It's because he wants things that Ottawa is not making available for First Nations. He wants training opportunities for young people at the nation. He wants to have a an actual tax base that they can use to derive revenues. Right now, you know, Ottawa is not a bottomless pit of cash, even though sometimes it looks that way, that gives everybody this, you know, free money. Uh, maybe some people are getting free money to study gender inequity in the energy industry, I suppose. But, but uh, for First Nations, they're left out. And so many of these up-and-coming leaders that I talk to are are not satisfied with that. And uh, so to have a process that uh, recognizes these First Nations, as well as ones on the coast that are, you know, more engaged in the litigation against, I think is a fair way to do it, ensure that all voices are heard. That would be a fair way to address what these justices uh, deem to be the case. In other words, they like the opportunity to get training and to have sustainable jobs. Yes, that's right. That's exactly what they're looking for. It seems pretty reasonable. If the majority of them were in favor of it, why do you think so much weight was given to the naysayers? Is it because they have more or better lawyers? Well, not only lawyers, but they have you know professors who are, again, what's, uh, all of this stuff seems to be from people on the public payroll, but we have professors at at universities in BC, there's one at SFU I know of who who has been very intimately involved in in using his political intelligence. You know, a former senior bureaucrat, now a professor, who who has been at the heart of 
the the American funded groups legal strategy to find a way to turn this thing upside down you know spent years and years on it uh, re- realized that uh, you know First Nations were a strategic key and ally in this and worked over years uh, I'm sure in good faith and with good intentions and all but but, but to use those First Nations in that way and um, I, I think I think that this is uh, such a, a delicate topic that a lot of people are uh, reticent to bring it up, but I think there's plenty of evidence for it. And once again, it goes back to those strategists in San Francisco and New York, or you know, they're saying, okay, what can we do to serve our supporters, those billionaires from, you know, Hewlett Packard or or the Tides Foundation? What what can we do to help them achieve the goal of stopping Canada from producing hydrocarbons? Well, let's see if we can get First Nations who who are uh, you know unhappy with some aspect of of their relationship with the federal government to be part of this. And, you know, I think if you, you start looking for that, that's part of it. And again, I, I offer that thought, Jim, knowing also that there are very real issues, you know, grievances, uh, First Nations have not had addressed properly, whether they're uh, on the coast or anywhere else in the country. And that is one of the great legacies of the country that isn't our proudest legacy. And we still have to keep working on it. A lot of work to be done. But let's let's also be clear that there's other things that work, too, in this. Stuart, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the ResourceWorks Society, his website, resourceworks.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for our guests or the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.